Now it's time to introduce our two speakers. Robert Nordland is the founder and CEO of Association Reserves and a certified reserve specialist. Association Reserves has prepared over 30,000 reserve studies for associations in 48 states over the last 28 years. He regularly writes on the topic of reserve studies and speaks at industry functions throughout the nation. Robert leads our corporate office in Calabasas, California, a suburb of Los Angeles, and supervises technical standards through our network of 10 Association Reserves regional offices. Eric Couchet is a sales and marketing professional, opening his own mortgage brokering firm in 2004. In 2009, when FHA released major changes in their condominium project approval guidelines, his firm evolved into a national consulting firm that helps condominium projects acquire and maintain their approvals with FHA and the VA. Ready Set Loan has helped hundreds of condominium projects nationally gain or maintain their FHA and VA approvals with a 100% success rate. Earlier this month, Ready Set Loan acquired FHA Condo Solutions in Seattle, which doubled the size of their company overnight. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Robert Norland. Robert. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. Eric, can you hear me and can I get a hello? Hello. Excellent. We have both microphones working. Well, as Paige mentioned, I've grown to enjoy Eric's advice on association finances, specifically FHA issues, and I've been looking forward to doing a webinar with him for some time now. Eric and I are here today because we see many associations having real questions about FHA approval and not getting a lot of clear answers on the matter. It's actually an interesting subject because FHA approval is a decision that arguably benefits the owners more than that benefits the association itself. But because the association is made up of owners, what's good for the owners is often straightforward, good for the association. So we're here to talk about FHA financing in your association, why it's an important issue, and like the title says, what's in it for you. Eric's gonna provide most of our content today, but first I want to remind you that as Paige mentioned just a moment ago, if at any time you have a question for one of the speakers, you can simply type that question into the dialog box similar to the one that you see on your screen. Now, Eric and I both enjoy speaking to a live audience, so if at any time we have a question for you and need your feedback, we'll ask you to raise your hands. And what that means is there's, look for it, it's again uh, similar to what you see on the screen, there's a little hands raised icon in your control panel. So you can respond to us uh, that way by clicking the hands raised. So let's just test that out. Grab your mouse and give me a hands raised if you're ready for us to get going on today's presentation. Oh, good, Eric, we've got a very capable group today. I see hands raised going up all up and down the list. Okay, I'm gonna put everyone's hands down and get on to our presentation today. So, what is FHA financing, Eric, and why should an association care? Well, FHA is an insurance fund for mortgages. Uh, FHA has a specific set of, set of guidelines for borrowers, and when the criteria are met, FHA will insure the loan for, uh, for the lender in case the borrower defaults at some point and the lender loses money. Uh, FHA itself is not a lender. Uh, and buyers will get their loans from lenders like Bank of America, Freedom Mortgage, Wells Fargo, etc. Uh, why? That's perhaps the more interesting question. Depending on the local market, roughly 30 to 40 percent of buyers are getting FHA insured loans. And taking us back to high school or college economics, uh, that's a big supply and demand issue. What that means is that if you can add 40% more people interested and able to buy units in the association, increasing de the demand, sales prices uh, are, are meant to go up. It's as simple as that, pretty much. Um, if your association is not FHA approved, you're basically cutting out 30 to 40% of the market uh, and interested buyers from purchasing a unit in the association. Uh, this can drag out marketing times, and in the real estate world, time on the market has a direct correlation to sales price. 
access to FHA borrowers is especially important for condominiums with unit values under 400,000 or under 600,000 in high cost areas. FHA sweet spot nationally is around 100,000 to 250,000 and represents roughly 60% of the loans that FHA insures. So let me get this right. FHA is not a lender and it's uh, basically a status that the association establishes. It doesn't really affect association ongoing operations. That's, that's correct. Yeah, both of them. Um, being FHA approved is a stamp of approval on the association that helps units uh, in the association sell faster, potentially for higher, more competitive prices by exposing the units to uh, a greater buyer pool um, than if the association wasn't FHA approved. Okay, so in addition to helping units sell faster and for higher prices by opening up to the larger buyer pool, are there other benefits? Certainly. Um, by demonstrating that the association is a low risk to the buyer, the, uh, the buyer has access to more favorable loan terms, meaning that uh, their, their budget is, is bigger uh, for the actual sales price. Uh, in addition, FHA buyers are owner occupants who typically live in their units an average of seven years, so that promotes um, owner occupancy within the community. In addition, being FHA approved means lenders can offer reverse mortgages. Reverse mortgages are when an owner is equity rich in their uh, property uh, but may be cash poor and wishes to gradually reduce their equity by getting payments from the bank. So in, in, es in, in essence, instead of paying the bank and increasing the ownership interest in the property, you can get paid by the bank and gradually lower the uh, ownership interest in the property. Uh, this is especially important to seniors who have uh, watched their home values appreciate but now have a limited income stream or, and, on, and are on fixed budgets. In many cases, it could mean the difference between uh, the senior losing their home or being able to continue to live there. Excellent. So still painting with a pretty broad brush, are there some basic rules or restrictions that make some associations not eligible for FHA approval? Yes, good question. Um, condominiums are the only type of common interest communities that FHA requires project approval. FHA will not insure loans to condominium unit owners or purchasers of condominium units unless the entire condominium project is first approved by FHA and is placed on the FHA approved condominiums list. Planned communities, planned unit developments, also known as PUDs or homeowners associations, are treated as single family homes, whether they are attached or detached units. FHA altogether removed the requirement for project approval of planned communities in 2003. Okay, well, let's now get down to some of the real questions. When you get FHA condo approval for your association, is it permanent or just a temporary status? Uh, it's a temporary status. It's, it's approved for two years, and so condominiums need to reapply every two years. The, that is so um, FHA can verify that the condominiums continue to meet their uh, guidelines. And are there minimums or maximums as far as the number of units in the association, the physical makeup? Uh, the only requirement as far as the number of units is there's a minimum number of units of two. Uh, there's no upper limit to the number of units. That's a pretty effective minimum. It, it, it is, yeah. <laughs> what about the size of the loans? Are there any uh, minimum or maximums as far as the unit values or loan sizes? And uh, let me follow that up. Does that vary across the country? Uh, places like Des Moines, Iowa, El Paso, Texas. Uh, what about that compared to a, a big expensive city like San Francisco, California, Miami, Florida, something like that? Yeah, th there is. there are minimum and maximum loan amounts. Uh, FHA itself does not have a minimum loan amount, uh, however, individual lenders might. Um, some lenders have a minimum loan amount of 40000 or 30000 50000 um, but FHA doesn't, doesn't set that. It does, however, set a maximum loan amount for uh, so-called forward mortgages, such as just regular 
mortgages, whatever you, you might think of a, a mortgage loan, a purchase loan, and they're based on the median home sales price in an area. Uh, to your specific examples, uh, the maximum loan amount in the San Francisco area is $625,500. In Miami, it's $345,000. However, in the state of Iowa, for the entire state of Iowa, the maximum loan amount is 271000 and that's, same, that's pretty much the same for the most uh, of the state of Texas as well. These are revised every year to account for fluctuations in the real estate market and, and uh, property values. Well, let me, let me clarify that a little bit. What about doing a small loan on an expensive condo? Can you do that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, when determining eligibility for a loan, only the loan amount is important. <clears throat> For example, a $100,000 loan can be done on a $500,000 unit anywhere in the country. Uh, as long as the loan amount is under the maximum loan amount for the area, there's no upper limit to the value of the unit or the property. Got it. And do the favorable FHA approval terms just apply to first-time buyers or all buyers? FHA insured loans are typically referred to as first-time buyer loans, um, but they're really available to anyone who meets FHA's criteria. <clears throat> first-time homeowners, previous homeowners, and even current homeowners who wish to retain their, their current house or unit but want to buy a new one in which they will live. And uh, another follow-up, how about, um, in addition to new buyers, any refinancing that your current owners might want to do? Sure, the uh, primary benefit to new buyers is the low down payment and the ability to obtain a gift for the down payment. Uh, a classic example of this would be a college student who recently earned a degree and found a, a great paying job. Uh, he or she might not have saved the down payment money and mom and dad can chip in and for the down payment, provide the entire down payment as a gift uh, for the purchase of the home. Um, so the, the the buyer, the, the, the college graduate, might have substantial um, earnings, but doesn't, but hadn't saved the money yet. So, the uh, the gift of a down payment comes in handy. Uh, FHA insured lo insured loans can also be uh, used to refinance existing loans of all varieties. If a homeowner currently has a conventional loan or an adjustable rate or even a high interest loan, subprime loan, what have you any of them can be refinanced into an FHA loan. Um, and also similarly to conventional loans, FHA does have a cash out refinance option that allows owners to draw on the equity that they've built in their homes um, for cash to pay bills and to lower their total monthly obligations. Very nice. Well, you mentioned reverse mortgages a few minutes ago. FHA approval opens up that possibility to your owners who desire to make their homes an income stream. Do the same loan limits apply, or is that a special request or addendum to the approval process that an association needs to uh, get endorsed? Well, a reverse mortgage isn't available to unit owners unless they are first approved, the, the condominium is first approved with FHA. A reverse mortgage is termed by FHA as a home equity conversion mortgage. And it's only available to seniors who have built sufficient equity in their homes. Instead of making monthly payments on a loan which reduces the principal, the senior actually gets paid by the lender for the equity in the home. Payments will continue as long as the senior meets the criteria, such as living in the home. If the home eventually develops a ne negative equity position, FHA will cover that equity negative equity position and the balance of it will not transfer to the senior's heirs. Another unique feature, though, of a reverse mortgage that not many people know about is the ability for seniors to use them to purchase units. In our current market, in many areas, property values have dropped and seniors are not able to profit enough from the sale of their homes to purchase a unit outright. Instead, they can use a purchase reverse mortgage that would allow them to make a large down payment and not have to make monthly mortgage payments. 
this would allow them to retain a lot of this, the profits that they earn from the sale of their home um, and not have to make monthly mortgage payments. For reverse mortgages, the maximum loan amount is $625,500 nationally. But there's no special request to the approval or anything like that. The senior simply applies for the reverse mortgage as he or she would apply for a typical mortgage loan with a loan officer. Presuming, of course, that the association is FHA approved. Correct. Got it. How about co-ops? Can they get FHA approved? Um, actually, financing and co-ops have been deemed by uh, to be beyond the risk tolerance of FHA. So um, FHA does not offer financing in co-ops. Got it. Well, uh, you've done a real good outline of um, establishing the physical side of things, the yeses and nos, but let's get to some of the issues over which the association has control, like the things that they do to make the association a low risk or high risk association in the eyes of the FHA by the way they operate. So first question, what does the FHA care about percent of units leased or rented? Uh, FHA says that at least 50% of the units must be inhabited by their owners, so no more than 50% may be owned by investors. How about short-term rentals or rental restrictions? Uh, short-term rentals, transient leasing, hotel-type services are not allowed within the condominium. Uh, transient leasing, um, for clarification, is, a, is allowing leasing for a period of less than 30 days. How about the overall budget? I, what I hear is that FHA wants to see the association having a realistic budget. What is that? What's it how is it defined and how does an association demonstrate that? FHA examines the association's budget, previous year's income statement, and current balance sheet. Uh, what, they, what they're looking for is that the budget must demonstrate that it's providing adequate funding to meet its expenses. It's pretty basic. But FHA pays particular attention to the insurance and maintenance of the common elements. The budget estimates are typically based on previous year's actuals. So if the association, for example, spent $100,000 last year for its insurance policies, the current year's expense for this line item should be about the same, maybe, maybe more, unless there's an explanation as to why that uh, line has been reduced. Moreover, if cash savings from an operating account is to be used to balance the budget, that's okay, but evidence must be provided to show that the funds are available in order to balance the budget. Okay, and now on to a favorite subject of mine. Does the FHA care how much money is in reserves, and if not, what do they look for? Uh, absolutely. One of the most highly scrutinized aspects of the review of the financial statements. Uh, FHA analyzes two components of reserves, reserve account balance and an annual contribution. Cash balance is a, a consideration, but the primary focus is to see whether the annual uh, reserve contributions are at least 10% of the total common assessments. So if the total annual homeowner assessment income, for example, is $500,000, they would want to see at least a $50,000 contribution to the reserve account. Now, this does not mean a net contribution to reserves, such as if the association deposits, in this example, $50,000 to reserves, but spends $25,000 on capital projects during the same year, it could be looked at as still making the statutory 10% contribution. The second aspect is that FHA does not want to see the reserve account balance drop below 10% of the annual common assessments. Got it. Well, how about delinquencies? That's another general performance-based uh, factor that the FHA can look at. Many associations are wrestling with delinquency issues. They know it's at the top of their minds. How does the FHA measure delinquencies and what are their requirements? Well, FHA's position on uh, owner delinquencies is that no more than 15% of the units may be more than 60 days delinquent in the payment of the common charges. Um, two key uh, points to note here is that uh, I said more than 60 days delinquent. Uh, that is not the 60-day delinquency rate. 
uh, it is calculated by those units that are more than 60 days delinquent. The other important aspect is that the delinquency rate is only calculated based on common charges and ordinary assessments. Uh, this would include such uh, income items as late fees, penalties, fines, and special assessments. Uh, but what, what would be included are the common charges, which also include monthly garage charges and parking assessments, which are monthly common and are expected to be ongoing. Got it. So if you've got some owner that's been fighting the board for six months over a um, a common area of fine or something like that, that's not going to be factored into a 60-day delinquency. That is not part of the delinquency right now. Got it. How about associations that are coming out of developer control? Any issues there with um, how many or what fraction of total units are owned by the developer? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And the, the answer to that really depends upon uh, a number of factors. But boiled down, it's um, the units that are developer owned that are currently being marketed and are not or have not previously been inhabited are not considered investor owned and therefore they're not included in the calculation for investor concentration. Uh, units that are considered investor owned if the developer owns them is if they have been occupied previously or are currently occupied whether or not the occupant paid rent to the developer. Uh, and those guidelines are for new construction projects only. Okay, and the same question, but let's twist it just a little bit. What about for a particular investor, not a developer, but uh, a quantity owner? Um, the single in entity investor cannot own more than 50% of the units. Um, so no more than 50% of the units can be investor owned. No one entity can own more than 50% of the units. And if one entity does own 50% of the units, the other 50% must be remaining uh, owner-occupied. That dovetails with that rental um, restriction, same fraction. Yep, that's right. Got, got it. Um, how? Um, let's see. Where do I where do I go? Um, how sensitive is the FHA? to those leased or rented units? And is there a difference between leasing and renting? What are the main issues? Uh, really, the determining factor is whether or not the owner lives in the unit. Um, so if the owner does not live in the unit, it is not owner-occupied, basically. It's, in, it's an investor-owned um, unit. Uh, that includes even if uh, the owner's siblings, children, parents, or other family members, friends, whoever, lives in the unit but the but the owner does not that's considered investor owned even if the person living there is not paying rent got it and there's probably a few people on the line that are in condos that were apartment conversions is that a particular class or are there different rules there um, it is it is a different classification uh, it depends on if the developer is still in control uh, I've worked with lots of condominiums who were converted from apartments, um, but the developer is long gone, all the units have transferred to unit owners, so they treat those as um, existing projects. But if the developer is still in control uh, or owns a, a, a vast number of units, the developer is treated as an investor, and so in order to get approved with FHA, that developer has to own 50% of the units or less. Got it. Uh, let me change the conversation a little bit. You were introduced a few minutes ago with a very impressive 100% approval rating, if I recall, and I'm sure that they don't all go through exactly smooth on the very first crack. So um, presuming the FHA bounces back some of your applications or you assist a condo that had been experiencing problems when they were doing it themselves, what are some of the common reasons for going back and resubmitting paperwork and getting an appeal done? There, there are a number of reasons that condominiums get rejected uh, by FHA on the first pass. Uh, on occasion, a file is rejected uh, for offensive legal language. Um, most commonly, there are leasing restrictions that violate FHA guidelines. Uh, sometimes the fidelity policy is too low or the management agreement has expired or contains provisions um, wh that, that are punitive uh, if, the if the agreement uh, has been uh, terminated. 
The most subjective aspect, though, of the FHA project approvals are the financials of the association. FHA takes many aspects into account, such as owner delinquency, reserve fund balance, age of the community, pending special assessments, pending litigation, and outstanding loans. For a wide variety, associations sometimes post fiscal losses or have to draw on the reserve account for emergency funding. For example, in the East this year, we were hit with unusual snowfall totals, which has pushed many associations into the red. For the most part, these, these losses can be explained. However, one that is difficult to overcome is when an association does not contribute the statutory 10% to the reserve account. Whenever the association's uh, financials don't appear to meet FHA's criteria, it is asked to provide a reserve study to show that the reserves, the financials, are sufficient, especially the funds that are for future capital projects. And Robert, uh, I attended a condo board meeting last night, and they asked me what re reserve fund strength is. I told them that I would ask you, so can you clarify that for me, please? <laughs> sure. Um, FHA is measuring a contribution rate, but there is something in the reserve say field that literally measures reserve fund strength. And per National Reserve Say standards, it's a term called percent funded. It reveals the balance between reserve fund cash and the deteriorated state of the association's assets. And you can imagine that with more deterioration or more assets, the association's going to need more cash in reserves. So in our industry, we measure reserve fund strength in terms of percent funded which tells you a lot more than just that cash balance that's in reserves. The contribution rate itself is going to influence the trend of percent funded. Strong contributions are going to strengthen the association's percent funded, and weak contributions, underfunding, is going to lower an association's percent funded and then uh, put it in a, a riskier position. And I've got another chart here that shows exactly what that relationship is. Uh, you can probably imagine, no surprise, that there's a direct relationship between percent funded and special assessment risk. As you look further to the left, as percent funded drops below 30%, you see the special assessment risk spikes. So that's what you really want to look for. Um, Anyone could look for percent funded in a current reserve study, but FHA chose a different measuring stick. They want to see the reserve contributions at least 10% of total homeowner assessments. Well, so um, what do you find is the is a typical reserve contribution rate? Well, uh, kind of like the um, the cash in the bank, it's going to be different for every different association, but with the associations that are well-funded and have sufficient funds for uh, avoiding special assessments and avoiding deferred maintenance, those associations typically have reserve contributions in the 15 to 40 percent range of total budget. That clearly is a lot higher than the 10 percent required by the FHA. So what we sense is that there's very, there's going to be very few associations that can realistically claim to be funding their reserves adequately with less than 10% of total budget reserve contributions. And I've got another chart here. It may sound like a lot when we talk about 15 to 40%, but still, that's not a lot of cash. For each homeowner, adequate reserve contributions are typically just 2 to $4 per day, and that's about as much as a premium coffee. And we look around, and with a number of Starbucks and other premium coffee locations all around the country, it's pretty clear to me that most Americans can afford that. Okay, let's get back to the main topic of this webinar, things the FHA looks for. Um, Eric, I've got another chart here. Can I get you to spend a, a moment on this list? What are some of the qualifying factors? All right, as far as the balanced budget goes, FHA likes to see that the income to the association is sufficient to cover its expenses. Um, obviously, that's what a balanced budget is. Occasionally, associations use uh, saved operating funds to balance the budget, and that's okay too, provided that we can provide evidence that the funds were available. Uh, reserves versus reserve study. Uh, we just covered this a bit, but it's also worth mentioning that an association 
can be allowed to contribute less than 10% per year to the reserve account, provided that it has a reserve study to state that that is adequate. If they're one of those exceptions, and that's really the true case of their association. Sure, and I've seen that a couple of times. Uh, the governing documents uh, lost the cover regarding that topic. Uh, the most common issues uh, are leasing restrictions. Uh, Short-term leasing restrictions that require board approval in order for a, a unit owner to lease or sell the unit. Um, those are forbidden by FHA. Um, requiring third-party approval, like such as a board, to uh, approve a potential tenant or lessee, um, that violates what they call free assumability, um, which infringes on the rights of the unit owners to uh, dispose or use the property in the way that they see fit. Or if uh, a condominium excludes leasing altogether, if, if leasing is not available in the project period, um, then that is typically a reason for uh, rejection. Special assessments, uh, having a special assessment is not typically an outright deterrent to getting approved. Uh, FHA does investigate special assessments in depth. They basically ask questions such as, why did the association need a special assessment? Was it not properly funding the reserve account? And that raises the question, is it properly funding the reserve account now? And so having a reserve study can help uh, allay FHA's concerns. And whenever I'm working with a condominium project uh, to get an approval, I always breathe a sigh of relief when I see that the association has and is following its reserve study recommendations. Okay, so let's say your association wants to become FHA approved. Where do they start? Uh, it sounds like a, a bit of a complicated issue. I imagine there's a number of consultants like you across the country. So what should they expect in general? Uh, well, they should expect to have some patience to begin with. Um, we are working with the federal government, and um, sometimes that uh, working with the government takes some time. Uh, it also takes time to assemble the documents and get everything squared away. Sometimes reviewing the paperwork can raise more questions, and which will require gathering further documentation. Uh, it's, I, I believe, though, it is valuable to work, with, to work with somebody who has experience with the process and who has worked with FHA and knows what FHA is going to look for uh, within the file. Generally, though, depending on the association and the condition of the paperwork, it could take from as little as two weeks to 90 days to gather the paperwork. Once FHA reviews the file, or receives the file, excuse me, it can take up to 30 days for the file to be reviewed. Uh, if you do decide to look into hiring a consultant, make sure the consultant does a thorough job of pre-qualifying the condominium. The vast majority of reasons why condominiums are rejected by FHA can be discovered during a, a comprehensive screening. And the cost of it is not that big of a deal. Uh, FHA approval is good for two years. So two years of homeowners will benefit from a small $800 to $1,200 investment on the part of the association. Well, that's a pretty attractive uh, small number. Let me start to bring this to a summary point. Um, when I think who has the most to gain, it sounds like it's literally the homeowners and it's the well-run associations that are best suited to getting approved. They're the ones with the balanced budgets, delinquencies under control, not too many investors or rented units. And it sounds like the condos with unit ranges or let's say loan values in the 50,000 to 300,000 range. And I also want to emphasize that even if you've learned that your association isn't well suited for FHA approval, it's probably good for you to know the guidelines because in general, uh, the kind of things we've been talking about are just plain good advice. Balanced budgets, limited delinquencies, things that make your association attractive and low risk. Well, Eric, we've covered a lot of material and I'm looking at the clock and I'm sure there's going to be some follow-up issues for our attendees. Uh, so I'm talking to everyone in the audience with questions about reserve says or those who need a proposal, please go to the Association Reserves website at www.reservesay.com. 
where you'll see links for our learning center or they can get a proposal by simply clicking the request a proposal link. And Eric has some great materials on his website. You can see that at www.readysetloan.com. I encourage you to sign up for his social media feed or stop by and read his blog regularly. He's got some great information there. So on behalf of Eric and myself, we want to thank you for attending our program today. We hope you're able to learn a few things that help you understand the relationship between FHA insured loans, FHA approved associations, and owners at your condo associations. And so now with the time remaining, I'm going to turn the mic over to Paige, who's going to serve as our MC for the Q&A portion of our program. Paige, it's all yours. <laughs>